Good, good evening, everybody, and a warm, very warm welcome to our um, webinar tonight. We're very pleased that so many people have joined us for tonight's meeting, in which we'll be focusing on thyroid disorders and pregnancy. We received so many questions about this topic, and it's really clear from the interest that we've had in tonight's meeting how many people are interested and keen to learn some more. We've had over 200 people sign up um, to the meeting, and that's patients and GPs and other medical professionals, so you're all very welcome. But before I introduce you to our two fantastic speakers tonight, just a quick plug for the BTF, the British Thyroid Foundation, and the work that we do to support people living with thyroid disorders. Almost all of our funding comes from our membership fees and donations and fundraising. So if you would like to support the charity and enable us to continue to provide free events like the one tonight and other webinars, please do consider joining the BTF or making a donation, however small, all of your support, in fact, any support, especially at a time like this when so many charities are, are struggling is really invaluable. So now I'd like to introduce you to our excellent and highly regarded speakers who've very kindly given up their, their time tonight. Professor Christine Bolart is a consultant endocrinologist at the University Hospitals in Birmingham. She's a, a lecturer at the university and um, she looks after patients at all the hospitals in Birmingham. She's spoken at many of our BTF events and is one of our medical advisors and I'm sure she needs no further introduction. And welcome also to Dr. Catherine Napier who's speaking for us for the first time tonight. Catherine's a consultant endocrinologist at Newcastle, Newcastle upon Tyne hospitals um, and we're very grateful that she's here too. I'm sure that many of you will have questions, so please do type them into the Q&A box on your screen, either during or after the presentations. You'll appreciate that the speakers, of course, won't be able to answer any um, specific questions of yours, only general questions. But if you've got any questions about your own care, you should really always go and speak to your own doctor, medical team. We may not be able to get through all of the questions tonight in the short time we've got. So if we don't get round to yours, you can, you're very welcome to contact the BTF after the meeting and we'll do our best to answer your question that way. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss anything um, or if you'd like to share anything with anybody else, uh, you can catch up with the link on YouTube, which we'll share in a few days. So without any more from me, I'll hand you over to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you for that warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here tonight talking about thyroid conditions in pregnancy, along with Professor Christine Bullard. I'd like to open this evening's webinar by looking at the topics surrounding hyperthyroidism in pregnancy and what this means in terms of monitoring and treatment. I'll start by sharing some slides and we'll be happy to take some questions once I've gone through those. So the reason that we care so much about treating hyperthyroidism in pregnancy is because of the risks of uncontrolled hyperthyroidism for mum and baby during the pregnancy. I'll look at these on the next slide, but then I'll move on to look at Graves' disease, the most common cause of hyperthyroidism in women of childbearing age, and I'll look at the monitoring of this condition during pregnancy. I'll talk separately about antithyroid drugs, which do have a potential impact on the developing baby, and I know this is something that can generate a lot of concern and questions from expectant mothers. I'll talk about postpartum thyroiditis, which is a common theme in the online forum, and I will mention breastfeeding and the use of antithyroid drugs during this as well. So in terms of risks of uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, we know that these can affect both mum and baby. And sadly, if you have uncontrolled hyperthyroidism, you are more likely to have a miscarriage. And this risk of pregnancy loss extends through the pregnancy. And sadly, pregnancies can end in stillbirth. We know with high levels of circulating thyroid hormones, you're more likely to develop blood pressure problems during your pregnancy. And this pregnancy induced hypertension at the most severe end of the spectrum can include preeclampsia. Preeclampsia by the nature of its condition means that the placenta is not functioning as well as it should. And this poses a threat to the pregnancy and to the health of baby. It can also result in early delivery and the increased likelihood of your baby needing to go to the special care baby unit for some extra support. 
Even without this, we know that the rates of preterm delivery are higher in uncontrolled hyperthyroidism than they are in new thyroid women. Uncontrolled levels of thyroid hormone can impact on baby's growth and babies may have a low birth weight. And at the more extreme end of the spectrum, there may be concern about fetal growth restriction. It's worth mentioning the rare but serious possibility of thyroid storm and heart failure in women who have uncontrolled hyperthyroidism. This of course can happen outside pregnancy too, but in pregnancy, not only do we have serious concern from mum who may need intensive care unit support, but also we have concern about the safety of the continuing pregnancy and the impact that this has on baby. So I hope those risks that we're, we're all aware of underline why it's so important to be euthyroid before conception wherever possible. And this is why we often be keen to get this message across in the endocrine clinic when we're talking to you about the management of your thyroid condition. This is why we're keen to look at the possibility of definitive treatment before you plan a pregnancy. Definitive treatment, as most of you know, means either a thyroidectomy or radioiodine. The timeline, of course, on planning your pregnancy depends on many factors in your and your family's life. But if it's possible to build in time for definitive treatment, that will really help the trajectory of any pregnancies going forward. What you choose as definitive treatment will also impact. And we know that if you have radioiodine, you'll have to delay your attempts to conceive for several months after you have this therapy. You can choose after a discussion with your healthcare team, of course, to, to manage your, your Graves disease and your hyperthyroidism with medication. But this will mean that we have to consider the risks of antithyroid drugs during pregnancy and that you'll have to be aware of the additional monitoring required during a pregnancy. I've put this table in here, which has been lifted from some of our international guidelines to try and show how we weigh up the pros and cons of definitive treatment or antithyroid drugs. We know that thyroidectomy, of course, means lifelong dependence on, on thyroid hormone replacement, and that too will need some adjustment during pregnancy. However, it tends to be much more straightforward than dealing with antithyroid drugs or unstable hyperthyroidism. Antithyroid drugs, though, will be easy to take. We can modify the dose, and we know that we can see gradual remission of thyroid autoimmunity during the course of antithyroid drugs, too. We need to consider the side effects that come with these drugs, and not just the fetal effects, but the potential side effects for mum as well. We know that mild side effects with, say, carbimazole, such as a rash, are common, but they're not serious. But there are some more significant side effects such as neutropenia, when the white blood cells which fight infection are lowered, and that can pose a significant risk to people in and out of pregnancy. I've used this schematic on the right-hand side of the slide from a recent review article this year um, that, that looked at the, the interplay between different factors in, in thyroid conditions during pregnancy. And the reason I put this in is because I want to talk about HCG, the pregnancy hormone, human chorionic gonadotrophin. So we know that Graves' disease will impact on your pregnancy, but you might be a woman who's early in her pregnancy and who's had a set of thyroid function tests that have shown some abnormalities. And of course, there are other causes of hyperthyroidism or a picture of subclinical hyperthyroidism on thyroid function tests early in pregnancy. The possibility of nodular thyroid disease and thyroid hormone release from a nodule or multiple nodules within the multinodular goiter is possible. But in pregnancy, the impact of HCG is a really uh, crucial one to be aware of. We know that human chorionic gonadotrophin rises through the first trimester and typically peaks at about 10 weeks. So what, why this is relevant is because it's structurally similar to, to TSH. And we know that HCG can stimulate the TSH receptor and this can lead to rising levels of thyroid hormone during this early phase of pregnancy. And this can be reflected if we check your thyroid function tests. You may have a low but detectable TSH, but this is normal and it's to be expected. It's part of the physiological process of pregnancy. In a subset of women, however, this TSH may be completely suppressed and women may develop symptoms. Now, we hope this is short lived and will only last for a few weeks early in your pregnancy. We would not use antithyroid drugs in this circumstance, but we might talk to you about using beta blockers to control some of your symptoms. We'll talk about some of the other relevant factors in this diagram, such as iodine, later on in this webinar. So here are some other factors that can be used if you're early in your pregnancy and you have an abnormal set of thyroid function tests to try and delineate the underlying cause. 
If you have other signs of Graves' disease, such as a thyroid goiter or signs of thyroid eye disease, we know that it's much more likely that the condition, or it is likely that the condition is Graves' disease. Whereas if you're someone who's been struggling with nausea and vomiting through early pregnancy or hyperemesis, this usually reflects higher circulating levels of HCG, which are more likely to cause changes in your thyroid hormone levels and more likely to give you abnormal thyroid function tests. Hyperemesis by definition is when you've lost more than 5% of your body weight. There is evidence of dehydration and ketones in the urine. And, and, and in the setting of hyperemesis, we know HCG is high and, and it can, can cause this problem. HCG also tends to be higher in multiple pregnancies if you're expecting twins or triplets. We have other methods of trying to, to figure out the diagnosis at this stage in your pregnancy. And we know thyroid receptor antibodies that I'll move on to talk about some more now are both sensitive and specific and are a really good test um, to, to employ. So I'd like to look now at monitoring during a pregnancy with Graves' disease. And I know for women, this can be an uncertain time. And how we monitor you during pregnancy will depend on whether you've had definitive treatment and whether or not you're on antithyroid drugs when you embark on the pregnancy. With all types of thyroid disease, we know that getting an early set of thyroid function tests is crucial. And with a history of current or previous Graves' disease, we would like a measurement of your thyroid receptor antibody or your TSH receptor antibody, your TRAB, early in pregnancy. Now, what happens next depends on the level of, of that TRAB result, because if we look at our international guidelines, we know that usually a level that's three times the upper limit or sorry, three times the, the what's considered as a cutoff for positivity is used for um, uh, it's used as a guide to say that later in the pregnancy, the baby needs dedicated fetal monitoring. And this is because thyroid receptor antibodies do cross the placenta and can impact on the developing baby. So we need to know what your thyroid function is early in pregnancy, of course, and we need to know what the level of TRAB is. Now, the reason I put in here a highlight for week 23 is because if you have a TRAB of five or above, we know that this is when you will get a dedicated fetal medicine scan. And it's at this stage of pregnancy that baby's thyroid is well enough developed for us to have a good look. So this is done by a dedicated fetal medicine team, and they've got access to additional scanning modalities over and above the usual ultrasound that you have in pregnancy for your dating and your anomaly scan. They'll have a good look at the baby's thyroid. They'll also look for any features perhaps of hyperthyroidism, such as an elevated heart rate in baby. And they can look at the amount of amniotic fluid around baby and decide whether that's appropriate or if there's a problem with excess fluid, which can highlight a problem. For women who are on antithyroid drugs, which are continued through the first, second or longer of, of the trimesters during pregnancy, in our unit, we do growth scans at weeks 28, 32 and 36. And that's because of an important point, which is that there is fetal concentration of antithyroid drugs. And this means when mum has a normal set of thyroid function tests and is considered euthyroid, unless we've carefully considered where in that normal range her thyroid hormones and her TSH are, baby can actually be overtreated. And that's why it's really important that we think about the antithyroid drug use during the pregnancy, what dose we've used, how long we've used it for, as well as the thyroid receptor antibodies and the impact of those. I've highlighted beta blockers at the side here because women who use beta blockers for symptomatic management of hyperthyroidism during pregnancy will also need growth scans. And this is because they can slow baby's growth, although we do try and minimize the dose. And this is one example of why it's so important to work together with the obstetrics team in a multidisciplinary team environment to care for women with Graves' hyperthyroidism. How your Graves' disease has been managed during your pregnancy and what treatment you've required impacts on what postnatal monitoring is required for baby after delivery. But all of our babies get TSH, free T4 and free T3 checked on umbilical cord bloods at the point of delivery. I look now at antithyroid drugs in pregnancy. Now, this is a huge area of the literature and I'm just going to cover it briefly this evening. So... These references are really from over the last 10 years, but there have been papers more recently than I've included here. And essentially, I want to look at the, the common defects with carbamazole and propothiourosome. 
It's been five decades now since we discovered that carbimazole could potentially have a negative effect on the developing baby. And aplasia acutis was the first abnormality that was discovered. And this is an abnormality in the skin and the formation of the skin, typically over or around um, the head of baby. But there are some other problems that we know are clearly associated with use of carbimazole, particularly during the first trimester and particularly during weeks six to 10. The higher the dose of the drug we use, the more likely we are to encounter problems. Propothiourosal for a long time was considered to be a much safer option and initially it wasn't considered to cause any problems in the developing baby. But actually, over time, we've realised that the rate of problems with PTU is probably approaching a similar rate to that with carbamazole. The, the incidence of these problems in babies born to mums who've been taking antithyroid drugs it depends on how we look at the data and how the clinical studies have been carried out. And some more recent studies will estimate the risk of problems in baby to be higher than the rates that I've quoted here. What is safe to say is that the profile of potential problems with PTU are milder than those seen with carbimazole. So we tend to see problems with skin cysts that can affect the face, the neck and the ear area in babies. And we can see problems with simple cysts on the kidney that have no impact on the baby's kidney function and problems in the ureter, the tube leading from the kidney to the bladder, particularly in, in male babies. Most of these problems that we see in babies born to mums who've taken PTU have no impact on the baby's health as they grow. So it seems simple to recommend that you use PTU, particularly during the first trimester. But what we can't forget is that it has a rare but serious side effect of liver dysfunction. This obviously can occur outside pregnancy as well. And over 10 years ago now, the United States Food and Drinks Administration issued a black box warning for PTU. And this is because in rare cases, so in one in 10,000 people that take the drug, it can lead to severe liver failure and occasionally, very occasionally, the need for consideration of liver transplant. So this is why we need to think about being aware um, during the pregnancy, flagging up to mum any symptoms and signs she should look out for and monitoring liver function tests during the pregnancy. So some of you may be familiar with looking at um, a figure similar to that on the left of the slide, but essentially it's to highlight the, the risk of um, using these drugs in pregnancy and the association with each of these defects listed under, under the drug. So methimazole and carbimazole are grouped together here outside of the UK. Methimazole is commonly used and carbimazole is a, a pro-drug of methimazole. Um, and you can see that the strongest association here with, with methimazole and carbimazole is um, the musculoskeletal problems in baby. And, and that includes defects in the abdominal wall where the skin across the wall hasn't formed properly. Um, and if you look down at PTU, as I've mentioned, cysts of the face and neck and problems in the urinary system are the most commonly um, associated problems. So that's been a, a quick run through all of the many things we need to think about during a pregnancy with Graves' disease. But of course, there's a lot to think about after baby's born as well. I've talked about checking thyroid function tests of, um, on the cord bloods at the point of delivery, but most babies do not need any further monitoring of their thyroid function tests after delivery. And less than 5% of babies born to mums who've been on antithyroid drugs during the pregnancy have problems that need any ongoing monitoring of their thyroid function tests or any treatment. Breastfeeding, of course, we would encourage you to do. We're lucky here to have a specialist infant feeding team who will see all of our women with pre-existing medical conditions to provide existing support from a specialist midwife before or after delivery. Um, but even if you don't have access to, to that level of support, you can breastfeed your baby on antithyroid drugs. We know that both carbimazole and PTU are transferred into, into breast milk in very small quantities, but that's not considered to have a negative impact on baby, particularly when we minimise the dose, which we will do when we follow you up after pregnancy. You can also split your dose across the day and feed baby immediately or take your dose immediately after feeding baby to try and minimise any transfer across. Of course, we need to be aware of the risk of relapse of Graves' disease um, following a pregnancy. And, and I'll highlight this with this slide here that's lifted, lifted from a paper around five years ago now. But what it shows really nicely, this is it, this um, thick black line shows the incidence of hyperthyroidism in women of childbearing age 
over the year before pregnancies, during a pregnancy and after their pregnancy. And the reason this is important is because it shows um, a, a rise in, in diagnosis in the early stage of pregnancy, but then a big fall off during the second and third trimester. And that's because your body does a great job of suppressing the immune system as the pregnancy progresses. So Graves disease and other autoimmune conditions tend to get better in the second and third trimester. But there is some payback after delivery when we see a big resurgence in what's happening with your immune system and immune dysfunction. And that's why we see high levels of hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease diagnosed in the year following delivery. I'll finish by looking at postpartum thyroiditis. This is a, a diagram on the left to show that not everyone has the same journey with postpartum thyroiditis. Some follow the very typical um, turquoise line here where there is a spell of, of higher levels of thyroid hormone which may give rise to symptoms. And that's because of a destructive thyroiditis in the early months following, following delivery of baby. And then women have a hypothyroid phase that usually resolves itself by eight to 10 months post delivery. Some women just have a hyperthyroid phase Phase, and some women only have a hypothyroid phase, but the vast majority, 8 to 10 or 10 to 12 months after delivery, will be euthyroid again. A small proportion will have persistent hypothyroidism. And do we treat this? Well, it depends on your symptoms and it depends on your TSH. But essentially, if you have a TSH of over 10 or a TSH of over 4 or above the upper limit of the reference range, but below 10 and symptoms, we would tend to advocate that you should have treatment with levothyroxine. This can then be withdrawn a year later to see whether or not your thyroid has recovered. But I would just caveat that with withdrawal of thyroxine to see what's happening should only be done if you're not planning another pregnancy in the short term. It can be difficult to make this diagnosis because there are so many overlapping symptoms um, in thyroid conditions with normal life, particularly in the early postnatal phase when you're exhausted and sleep deprived and you may have some changes in your mood. But if you have a new problem with feeding, that should be a trigger to make you think, oh, hang on, maybe I should get my thyroid function test checked. Its prevalence is considered to be at least 5%, if not more, so it can affect one in 20 women. If you have positive thyroid peroxidase antibodies just before you, your pregnancy or in the first trimester, you're likely to, you're more likely to develop postpartum thyroiditis. And if you have type 1 diabetes, a third of women with type 1 can develop postpartum thyroiditis in the year after delivery. It also predicts your, your risk of this again in subsequent pregnancies. And if you've had it once, the chances of you getting it again in a subsequent pregnancy are around about 50%, so it's so a really significant risk. And about 10 years after a diagnosis of postpartum thyroiditis, about a quarter of women will go on to have autoimmune hypothyroidism. So I hope that's been a, a whistle-stop tour through some of the key points about hyperthyroidism in pregnancy and the management of postpartum thyroiditis too. And we'll try and answer some questions now um, that you have. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, just looking at the questions that are coming in. So one question is, um, once definitive treatment has happened, in brackets thyroidectomy, is someone still considered to have thyroid disease? Yeah, it's a good question. So the thyroid itself has been removed and with that brings a lot of stability and it certainly makes the journey through a subsequent pregnancy smoother. But Graves' disease fundamentally is a problem with the immune system. So by removing the thyroid, we don't remove that fault in the immune system. So you would still be considered to have Graves' disease. We know that gradually following thyroidectomy, the levels of thyroid receptor antibody do fall in the months and years. But I would certainly be keen to see you in the endocrine obstetrics clinic in the years following your thyroidectomy so I could monitor you during your pregnancy. Thank you. Um, and then a further question. There's a number of questions here on hypothyroidism, and hopefully after uh, my presentation, they'll become more clear, but we can specifically address them. The, a second question relating to your presentation. What is the significance of TPO or TSH receptor antibodies to be checked during pregnancy, particularly if the patient is euthyroid? In, of TPO antibodies. TPO and TSH. It says TPO stroke TSH. Ah, uh, right. Okay. So I think the, the TPO and the thyroid peroxidase antibodies will deal with um, in the second half of the webinar. It's it's probably simpler. But what's the significance of checking them in, in a pregnancy 
um, otherwise. So if you have a history of prior Graves disease, um, whether or not you've had definitive treatment with radioiodine or thyroidectomy, we'd like to check them. If you have an abnormality in your thyroid function test that presents for the first time during early pregnancy, we'd like to know what your thyroid antibodies are there. And I showed a, a key differential there with gestational hyperthyroidism or, or transient thyroid toxicosis in the setting of pregnancy. And using thyroid receptor antibodies can help delineate whether it's Graves disease or a transient problem with pregnancy. If I'm not sure whether or not you've got an underlying thyroid problem and I'm seeing you in pregnancy, of course, I would check your TPO antibodies as well because it will, it will give me a guide as to whether or not you have autoimmune thyroid disease. Okay, thank you. Um, so there is a question that says how to monitor post-delivery. Um, I presume that that relates to, you know, your presentation with postpartum thyroiditis and how to monitor thyroid function post-delivery. Okay. Um, I will I will come back to the hypothyroid part of this in my talk, but maybe maybe I'll just let you answer the hyperthyroid part of that. Absolutely. So there's no universal screening for women postnatally to screen for thyroid problems, but targeted screening can be appropriate if you have a history of autoimmune conditions, autoimmune thyroid disease or a strong family history, for example. It's very reasonable for your thyroid function test to be checked three months after delivery. Um, and I would encourage you to seek your thyroid function tests um, being checked if you're encountering problems with um, mood changes, weight loss, feeling unwell, difficulties with breastfeeding. Those would all be very valid reasons to have your thyroid function test checked and be screened for postpartum thyroiditis, which as we know is a common problem. Lovely. Um, a further question is, is there any treatment for high antibodies following removal of the thyroid? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, at the moment, no, but watch this space about upcoming clinical studies in Graves' disease over the next few years. But essentially, once your thyroid's removed, your antibodies will slowly decline. And with radioiodine as definitive treatment, we know that there will be a spell in the three to six months following radioiodine as definitive treatment where there will be higher levels of thyroid receptor antibodies. But again, once you get to 12 months and after 12 months, the level of those antibodies declines. So we can't give you anything to take the antibodies away, but having definitive treatment will encourage them to fall and should make the management of the subsequent pregnancy more straightforward. Lovely. And then I think the final question before we'll go over to, I think just um, right, the right time then, uh, is which anti thyroid drug would be your preferred choice, PTU or carbimazole, and what is the suggested dose? Yeah, so PTU is um, our preference for the first trimester or for women who aren't using secure long acting methods of contraception and are open to getting pregnant. Um, and then once we get past the first trimester, so somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks, opinions differ, um, it's best to, to aim to transfer over to carbimazole. Now changing antithyroid drugs, we don't always love doing that because we can destabilize the thyroid function, particularly during pregnancy, we're very keen to maintain stability, but we've got to balance the risks of liver function problems on PTU and the risks of problems in the developing baby. The suggested dose depends on what your Graves disease is like. Do you have severe Graves disease with high levels of circulating thyroid hormones and high levels of antibodies? If so, you're likely to need a higher dose of an antithyroid drug to gain control. That being said, we will absolutely dose minimize in early pregnancy, throughout pregnancy and during breastfeeding. So the lowest possible dose needed to keep UU thyroid will be what we use. And then just very quickly, uh, another question snuck in. Uh, if TRAB, uh, so the CSH receptor antibody levels are positive, but only just above the top end of the reference range after pregnancy, and thyroid function does indicate overactivity, is that Graves or is it postpartum thyroiditis? Yeah, good question. So it depends a little bit what your, your antibody was like before pregnancy. So if you had a clear, secure diagnosis of Graves disease, but your thyroid receptor antibodies were declining over time, you need to be mindful of that you know, resurgence of your immune dysfunction that we see post-pregnancy and the high likelihood of a relapse of your Graves disease or a need for, for an escalating dose of antithyroid drug therapy in the months and year postpartum. That being said, we know if you have thyroid antibodies that you can also develop postpartum thyroiditis. So it depends a little bit on what, what was happening with you before pregnancy in the early stages of pregnancy um, and being looking carefully at your thyroid function tests and your antibody levels over time.
Um, I think what they wanted was like, I think it's newly presenting uh, paratoxicosis uh, right. post delivery, so not diagnosed before pregnancy. Okay, so if it hasn't been diagnosed before pregnancy and you have, so if your thyroid receptor antibody is positive, you've probably got Graves disease. Um, and of course you can get, you can get Graves disease without positive thyroid receptor antibodies just to complicate the picture, but that's our job to figure out. And there are other features we can use such as the ratio of your free T4 and free T3 um, to each other it can help guide whether or not you've got Graves disease or whether whether or not you've got a more a thyroiditis type picture um, and we can think about your personal and family history of autoimmune conditions and weigh up what's more likely but regular monitoring will reveal the answer yes uh, i i agree so the the clinical course if you really want to know then a technetium scan is mm -hmm. very useful because there'll be no uptake in a thyroiditis mm -hmm. um so i you know i find that a, a further very useful tool the first six months after delivery, it's more likely to be postpartum thyroiditis. If it's between six and 12 months, it's more likely to be Graves' disease, but none of these things are absolute. I think that's the questions on hyperthyroidism. So maybe I'll then move over to the other side, uh, hypothyroidism, um, and then we'll take, we'll take some more questions. So I'll just start sharing my screen now then. Um, Right. Um, so some of the questions uh, that that come up regularly that Julia sent to me that come up regularly in, in the fora and, and that they get asked regularly uh, relate to overt hypothyroidism. When should levothyroxine be increased? What should uh, ideally the, be the TSH level? Uh, what are the consequences if TSH is not kept in the ideal range? Um, and then what is the pathway taken for both hypo and hyperthyroidism? We've already he heard about hyperthyroidism. Um, and should patients be seen both by an endocrinologist and a midwife or obstetrician. So I won't dwell on this. Catherine has already explained how thyroid function changes physiologically in pregnancy. This graph here summarizes it. So as HCG peaks early in pregnancy, TSH will be at its lowest level. 3T4 uh, will go up early in pregnancy, but will then settle. But what we have is increased binding of uh, thyroid hormones. So therefore, if you check total T4 and uh, thyroxine binding globulin, they will go up. There is increasing thyroxine degradation as the pregnancy advances and uh, increasing thyroxine transfer to the fetus during pregnancy. So guidelines recommend that in order to interpret thyroid function, you use specific reference ranges. So reference range specific to pregnancy, uh, ideally determined in women who have optimal iodine intake and who don't have thyroid disease. Now that may not be feasible, um, I work in a center where we have pregnancy specific ranges, but if that's not feasible, then what you need to do is know your assay. So you know uh, what the pregnancy specific range for that assay would be. And if that is not possible, then generally the upper limit of normal for TSH in pregnancy is considered to be four millionaires per liter. So this slide here is a summary of what goes wrong when you have overt hypothyroidism in pregnancy. Some of these studies are quite old, uh, but you can see that there is an increased uh, risk, increased incidence of a number of uh, adverse obstetric outcomes, miscarriage, placental abruption, uh, high blood pressure during pregnancy, you name it. So a lot of complications have been uh, linked to untreated overt hypothyroidism in pregnancy. And then uh, what sparked off a whole range of uh, research, uh, uh, this landmark paper here 19, from 1999, indicating that if in women who have a higher serum TSH, so who either have uh, mild or overt hypothyroidism, that the uh, IQ in the offspring is lower. So um, in this study, the untreated women uh, who had a high TSH, the child IQ was 100. Um, whereas with maternal, if maternal thyroid function was normal, that was 107. So a seven point shift in IQ on a population base is absolutely huge. Um, so this is the protocol that we follow in Birmingham and, and that is based on the American Thyroid Association guidelines. And it is very much an aim to prevent abnormality in thyroid function. So if you have known hypothyroidism, then it's important that before you become pregnant, your TSH is in the ideal reference range, and that should be a TSH below 2.5.
so adequate replacement before you become pregnant. I tell all women who come to my clinic or women who I see in the pregnancy clinic that if they become pregnant again, as soon as they have a positive pregnancy test, double the dose on two days of the week, because generally uh, the increased requirement for uh, thyroid hormones is about 20 to 30 percent. And it's much easier for patients to double the current dose that they have rather than, say, go up from 75 to 100 micrograms, uh, which requires them getting potentially a new prescription from the GP. So double the dose on two days of the week. That is the best way to deal with it. It's about regular monitoring and women who come to my clinic will have four weekly thyroid function tests, especially in the first 20 weeks, because that is the crucial part where the mother is responsible for thyroid hormone supply to herself and to the baby. I don't wait for TSH uh, to, to change or to even uh, go near the upper limit of normal. So the aim is to keep TSH below 2.5 um, and I therefore do predictive dose adjustments uh, if I think looks like this TSH in this patient is going up. And then the, uh, I show you, showed you that rise in thyroxine binding globulins. So the increased proteins that you have in pregnancy will last for about two weeks after delivery. And therefore, um, my advice usually is that they stay on the increased dose, generally increased dose, um, until uh, two weeks after delivery and that they then return to their pre-pregnancy dose with a request for the GP to repeat thyroid function at the postnatal check. So that's overt hy hypothyroidism. What then about subclinical hypothyroidism? And so the questions that come up there is, is this linked to an increased risk of miscarriage? Should all women with subclinical, so this is a sort of mildly, so this means a TSH that is above normal, with normal circulating T4, should we start levothyroxine? And what TSH levels do we aim for? So this is the guidance from the American Thyroid Association guideline, and that is very much based on whether women are TPO antibody positive or negative. So if women have TPO anti uh, have positive TPO antibodies, we know that it's much more likely that their thyroid function will become abnormal during pregnancy or at some point during their life. So there, the recommendation is that if TSH is above the upper limit, ideally of the uh, pregnancy reference range, um, or definitely if it's above four, that we replace with levothyroxine. It is unclear currently on uh, the uh, studies that we have whether TSH between 2.5 and the upper limit of normal uh, should be treated uh, with levothyroxine, but certainly we would not, they would not recommend that you start treatment if TSH is below 2.5. This is different if women are TPO antibody negative, where, um, and this is similar to the general population, where you would start levothyroxine if TSH is over 10, and where you may consider it if it's above the upper limit of normal but below 10. So there is an impact statement from the uh, Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that uh, I was part of, looking at subclinical hypothyroidism and fertility. Um, and um, inevitably, the data assessing this are uh, not necessarily consistent, and that is because uh, populations are different, there are not, not adequate control groups, and subclinical hypothyroidism is generally differently defined. What they recommend, however, if that if women are not on levothyroxine, that a serum TSH greater than four should be treated, but not when a serum TSH is below 2.5 and four. Um, there is low quality evidence, uh, again, that, that you should treat above four, but generally uh, this may be considered. Um, and that is also because the, um, the risk of pregnancy loss is uh, highest in those women where TSH is above four. So TSH above four uh, with normal free T4, generally we would treat. So if women are known to have positive antibodies, then it's appropriate that you check their thyroid function, especially when they're trying to become pregnant. So uh, in the six months uh, before conception, ideally you, you want to check that their serum TSH is within an acceptable range. Um, if you have, if women are on levothyroxine for subclinical hypothyroidism before they become pregnant, then again, similar to those with overt hypothyroidism, we would suggest an empirical dose increase and again, regular monitoring. If women have subclinical hypothyroidism but are not on treatment, then it's really important that you measure TSH, preferably uh, early on in pregnancy, so around seven to nine weeks. Um, and if uh, TSH is outside uh, the accepted reference range, so greater than four, that treatment is started. Um, so 
indeed, subclinical hypothyroidism is linked to an increased risk uh, of uh, miscarriage and of preterm birth. The best data we have, so you can see here, uh, these are summary data encompassing about 47,000 women from 19 different cohorts. Uh, and what this graph here illustrates is that women with subclinical hypothyroidism and with another form of mild hypothyroidism in pregnancy are at increased risk of having preterm birth. Um, and further studies that have been done have shown that this is uh, associated with an increased risk of pregnancy loss, as is illustrated in uh, this table here, but also an increased risk of placental abruption, premature rupture of membranes, as well as fetal and neonatal death. So what data do we have on treating these women? So this is not, these are not data from a trial. These are data from a large database study where 5,000 women with subclinical hypothyroidism were treated with levothyroxine. And you can see that there was an, a positive effect on pregnancy loss, which was lower in those women. However, uh, this is the first time that we actually got a signal that potentially overzealous replacement, so giving too much levothyroxine um, to those women, might be associated with an increased risk of preterm delivery, gestational diabetes, and preeclampsia. I told you about uh, the effects of subclinical hypothyroidism on uh, fetal uh, brain function and cognitive development. We have had two trials, two large trials in this setting, where women with subclinical hypothyroidism were treated with levothyroxine. So this was a trial from the United Kingdom uh, and Italy. There was also one in the United States. And essentially, this showed that there was no positive uh, benefit on uh, children's IQ by giving these women levothyroxine. One criticism here is that the dose that of levothyroxine that was given in this trial was actually quite high, 150 micrograms, uh, higher than we would usually give, but also that uh, maybe we started, it was started too late. If you start at 13 weeks of pregnancy, you may have already missed the boat of having positive effects on uh, fetal brain development. But again, a further signal indicating that it's really important that we keep the serum free T4 in the normal range is from this study here. So this is from the Netherlands, nearly 4,000 mother and baby pairs. Mothers had their thyroid function measured at 18 weeks and child IQ was assessed around six years. And you can see here this inverse U-shaped curve. And so what this indicates is that women who have a high free T4 so potentially those women who, who were giving too much uh, levothyroxine to actually the child IQ is worse, as um, in, not surprisingly, uh, if free T4 is low. So it's really important that we try and keep it in a quite tightly controlled range. What about TPO antibodies then? So TPO antibodies per se have been linked to an increased risk of miscarriage and adverse outcomes. Again, the same uh, study here that looked at these uh, 47,000 women. You can see that women who have positive TPO antibodies are at increased risk of preterm birth, and particularly if their serum TSH is above four. So that brings uh, with it the recommendation, especially in TPO antibody positive women and a TSH above four, give levothyroxine replacement. Um, what about women who have a serum TSH uh, that is within the normal range, so not above four? So we've had three trials here. I'm going to show you data from two trials. Uh, so this was a, a trial in the setting of fertility, where women uh, who had positive TPO antibodies but had a serum uh, TSH that was within the normal range, so below four, were either were randomized to receive either levothyroxine um, or uh, placebo. And you can see that this had no positive effect on miscarriage rate. So this, this trial was negative, no positive effect on the primary outcome. So miscarriages were not less in those women receiving levothyroxine and none of the secondary outcomes uh, were affected. A further large trial, the tablet trial, again, looking at women who had positive TPO antibodies, but normal thyroid function, who were randomized to either receive levothyroxine or placebo. Uh, this trial, I was part of it, um, looked at uh, the primary outcome was a live birth at uh, 34 or more weeks. And again, this was negative. And when we looked at secondary outcomes, so earlier miscarriages, again, there was no difference. So currently, we have no evidence that giving levothyroxine to women who have positive TPO antibodies results in better outcomes. We know that those women are more likely to have adverse pregnancy outcomes and to have miscarriages, but it does not appear to be driven via their thyroid function. 
And it may be that this is just a more generalized autoimmune effect that we're seeing rather than uh, it being driven by uh, hypofunction. There were then a number of questions about congenital hypothyroidism and uh, whether they should be treated differently. So uh, people with women with congenital hypothyroidism, again, it is levothyroxine uh, replacement and the management is uh, as in any hypothyroidism, so the same as in autoimmune hypothyroidism. Uh, and then a further question was, is this hereditary? Well, congenital hypothyroidism usually is sporadic, but about 15 to 20% is genetic. Um, most cases where there isn't, so you can either have a problem with a thyroid gland that is not formed properly, and that's inherited only in up to 5% of cases, but it can be a problem that the machinery that you need to make thyroid hormones is disturbed, and that tends to be more hereditary, and that's usually what we call an autosomal recessive uh, condition. With regards to will my child inherit my autoimmune thyroid disease, well, we know that autoimmune thyroid disease runs in families and about 80% of this is determined by genetic factors. We have insufficient evidence to screen all children of mothers uh, of, who have autoimmune uh, thyroid disease for their thyroid function. Um, and by definition, all newborns across the world uh, will have a, a serum TSH checked at birth because what we want to do is pick up congenital hypothyroidism early. So um, is a child of a mother with autoimmune thyroid disease more likely to get it? I think probably yes, but there is insufficient evidence to do routine screening. Um, and then finally, um, we, there were a few questions relating to iodine and iodine supplements. What are the requirements and what is the safety of taking this, uh, especially if you have on, if, if you also have uh, an overactive thyroid gland? Well, so iodine requirements go up in pregnancy. So you can see here um, the requirements for school-aged children and adults. Um, and generally, uh, for uh, non-pregnant adults, the requirement is that they have a urinary iodine concentration between 100 and 299. Um, in pregnant women, this is slightly higher. And so it's generally recommended that pregnant and lactating women have uh, more uh, iodine a day and about 250 uh, micrograms of iodine will be sufficient. Do we have evidence that pregnant women are iodine uh, insufficient? Well, yes. So this is here is a summary of a number of studies all performed uh, in the United Kingdom, indicating that uh, a significant number of pregnant women are actually iodine sufficient. Indeed, most pregnancy supplements, not all, but most pregnancy supplements will contain iodine. The amount of iodine that's given is safe, even for women who have existing hyperthyroidism, as long as you don't uh, start taking things uh, like kelp that really contain very excessive amounts of iodine, the pregnancy supplement is safe even in hyperthyroid women. Um, so there has been some uh, research done on what uh, the pregnancy uh, outcomes are in women who have iodine uh, deficiency. So again, this was a study that I was involved uh, in looking at obstetric complications in women who took part in the ALSPAC cohort. So these were women, a uh, cohort of women that were monitored, uh, where you can see um, for a large number of pregnancies who had a median urinary iodine concentration of 95.3. So they were mild to moderate iodine deficient, but actually there was no uh, effect. None of these p-values are significant. So no significant effect on any of the adverse uh, outcomes. This study um, from 2013 looked at uh, brain development uh, in women with mild to moderate uh, iodine deficiency. So again, from the same ALSPAC cohort, um, this time looking at about a thousand uh, women with singleton pregnancies, all of whom had a urinary iodine measurement in the first trimester. And you can see that uh, depending on the iodine status, so those uh, children from mothers that had the lowest iodine concentration uh, were actually at increased risk of having diminished verbal and uh, reading IQ. So what about uh, iodine supplements? Uh, so it's very clear, and this is a very old study here uh, from 1971, but this is one of the first studies showing in areas of very severe iodine deficiency. So this was in, in East New Guinea, uh, where women were given um, iodine uh, during pregnancy or not. And you can see that the child IQ was significantly higher um, in treated women. So in severe iodine deficiency, there is no doubt that it makes a difference. 
More recently, what we've had is a trial in India and Thailand, where again, there is mild iodine deficiency. And again, here, giving iodine supplements really did not seem to affect uh, outcomes significantly. So that is what I wanted to say about iodine. Um, I will stop sharing and um, happy to take any questions now. Thanks, Christine. We've had a few questions coming through. So maybe to start with, um, so if you have a woman during pregnancy who is severely hypothyroid following a previous thyroidectomy but has good compliance, what would you recommend? What other things should we consider to improve the thyroid hormone levels during pregnancy? It's highly unlikely that someone with a, a very high TSH is compliant with their treatment. So what you should do is increase the dose. And I would suggest that we have uh, sufficient iodine replacement as well. But there isn't anything else that we can give to someone who is hypothyroid. And the replacement treatment here is levothyroxine. I saw uh, earlier that someone was asking about T3, T4 replacement. So it's very clear that T3 does not cross the placenta. OK, so women who are on T3 treatment or T3, T4 combination treatment, if I if I have the opportunity of speaking to them before they become pregnant, I say, actually, when you're trying to become pregnant and during pregnancy, I would like you to just be on levothyroxine because we know that crosses the placenta. And it may be if you are on T3, T4 replacement, that your thyroid function is actually fine, but the baby doesn't get enough thyroid hormone because T3 doesn't cross. So guidelines are very clear that during pregnancy, it should be levothyroxine uh, replacement, not a T3 replacement, no combination therapy. Someone with a high TSH, um, you just need to increase the dose of levothyroxine until you get that better. Okay. And a question about following a thyroidectomy, are you considered differently? Does overt hypothyroidism mean that you've had a thyroidectomy? And should your thyroid hormone replacement change during pregnancy? Yes, um, again, the, the requirements um, will, be, will be the same. So what, what we know uh, in someone who has a thyroid gland that's affected by autoimmune disease and that therefore struggles, um, that uh, we need to increase the dose because that thyroid gland is not able to uh, meet the increased demand. If you don't have a thyroid gland, then again, it is a very similar situation that you need to increase the dose um, and it's so for anyone who is on levothyroxine replacement for overt or subclinical hypothyroidism in accord with our latest guidelines is that you increase the dose uh, by doubling this ideally by doubling it on two days of the week um, but also and uh, this, this comes with a caveat so you uh, I ask my, uh, my patients to double it on two days of the week, but also that they have a relatively early thyroid function test so that more targeted changes can be made if needed. Okay. And just an attendee looking for confirmation, if their TSH is already in the optimal part of the reference range, should they still be increasing their thyroxine, even yeah. if their level looks good? Um, I would I would still increase it. So the only situation where I don't increase is, uh, and this is only a handful of women who might be on TSH suppression for thyroid cancer, um, who are already taking high doses. And in those women, I would probably do a thyroid function test first before I increase it, because we know that overdoing it is also not good. Okay. Can women take standard pre-pregnancy and pregnancy multivitamins, or would you recommend additional supplementation? No, standard standard, uh, standard uh, vitamins is fine. So standard preg pregnancy uh, supplementation vitamins is fine. Great. Is it difficult to stabilise patients' dose of levothyroxine following their pregnancy? It can be. Um, so like I said, the increased levels of uh, binding proteins will, will be present for about two weeks. Um, it can be difficult. Also, after delivery, there can be a degree of postpartum thyroiditis, which can do various things to thyroid function. So in some patients, it can be more difficult to find the balance there uh, than in others. And again, the, the key is to do close monitoring and uh, regular sort of uh, updates to, to thyroid function as needed, uh, as in adjustments to the levothyroxine dose. Okay. And we have a question about checking thyroid function tests in early pregnancy if you have no previous thyroid diagnosis. Okay, so that's a very thorny subject, screening, universal screening for all women in pregnancy. So 
experts are not in agreement necessarily. Uh, the stance of most guidelines and my stance is we have insufficient evidence to do universal screening in pregnancy. I think we should do targeted screening so women who are at increased risk of uh, thyroid disease should have a screening. Um, in women with infertility um, or recurrent miscarriages, again, the, the jury is out, but uh, again, there I would have a low threshold for checking it. But I don't think that every single woman who becomes pregnant should have their thyroid function checked. Um, I don't think we have sufficient evidence for that. Okay. What do you think about once weekly dosing for women with treated hypothyroidism when they go into pregnancy? Yeah, so a, a, few, of, a few of my patients have once weekly dosing. Um, they tend to be with people who forget to take their tablets, but you know, for some time we have then established them on a once weekly dose. I have actually taken a, quite a few women through pregnancy with a once weekly dosing. Um, so often women who have very high TSH um, who, who say, look, I'm compliant. So often, you know, they actually come to our clinic. We give them the levothyroxine under supervision. Um, and for most of those women, actually, the thyroid function normalizes. So is it ideal? No. Is it safe? Yes. Um, and it's better than the alternative, which often is having a very high TSH, which, which is definitely not good. So it is safe. If women have concurrent iron deficiency, how should we approach treating that? Yeah, so iron deficiency needs treatment. I tell all my patients uh, that they may well have to go on iron tablets in this pregnancy. You know, anemia is common, iron deficiency is common. I tell them to take their iron at least four hours away from taking the levothyroxine. And we have a question about someone who's received a diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Does receiving that diagnosis mean anything should be done differently when they're on levothyroxine? No, so most people with on levothyroxine will have Hashimoto thyroiditis because that is the most common reason for having it in the Western world, which is autoimmune thyroid disease. So um, the fact that they have Hashimoto thyroiditis by definition means that they have raised TPO antibodies. And therefore, if, you know, if they're already on levothyroxine, there is no, diff no different approach. Uh, if they're not on levothyroxine and they're TPO antibody positive, then you know I, I think definitely if the SVG is over four, I would treat. But I would probably treat both TPO positive and TPO antibody negative women with a TSH over four. Okay. And are there any dietary changes you would recommend to increase chances of fertility when you have a thyroid condition? No, I think a normal healthy diet is fine. Um, I think vegan diets uh, often result in iodine deficiency. Um, and I would recommend against those. Uh, if you take them, then definitely uh, take your pregnancy supplements. Uh, there is evidence both in vegan and uh, vegan pregnant and non-pregnant women that there is iodine deficiency. So that would be my only concern. Other than that, a healthy, balanced diet uh, with a reasonable amount of dairy is, is a good plan. Okay. Um, and we we'll probably won't get through all of these questions, but if a patient thinks they're allergic to levothyroxine, what would you recommend? Hmm. There is very little evidence that there is true allergy to levothyroxine. So there are some people who are allergic to some of the excipients that are in, you know, which, which is the bits that you need to make a tablet. Um, and so I've looked at this repeatedly with our pharmacists, and actually there was very little difference between the excipients in different tablets. So some, some women, uh, or people, uh, men as well, feel better on a certain brand of levothyroxine. If that is the case and you can find that brand, then it's fine. So the guidance from uh, MHRA, which I helped write, is if women do not tolerate the tablets or are allergic to certain forms, then liquid levothyroxine is an option because that has less of the excipients that is more expensive and therefore often GPs don't like it. Okay. But liquid levothyroxine is an option there in selected cases. Okay. I'll let you, Christine, maybe just have a look through. I think we've covered most of those questions related to hypothyroidism and I'll answer a question about beta blocker use during pregnancy um, yeah. while you just have a little look in case sure. there's a final question. So there was a question about um, treatment of gestational hyperthyroidism related to high levels of the pregnancy hormone HCG. So we don't use antithyroid drugs to treat this. Many women will not need treatment at all, but simply monitoring. But if you have symptoms of hyperthyroidism, we will use beta blockers, but we use them at the, the lowest possible dose. We'll usually use propranolol, and you normally don't need more than two or four weeks treatment. 
Um, and if you similarly, if you need treatment uh, for symptoms of hyperthyroidism in the setting of postpartum thyroiditis, different beta blockers have different levels of transfer into breast milk. Um, dose minimization again is key, and propranolol is a reasonable choice. So there's a question on, on which antibody levels to aim for. So um, it's a bit of a bugbear for me. So we don't aim for antibody levels, okay? Because um, generally, you, I think it's a good idea to measure TPO antibodies in someone who has thyroid disease, but there should be a single treatment because our treatment isn't actually governed by the level of antibodies. And I often get this, that someone has antibodies that are 200, and then I get a letter saying, oh, the patient's antibodies have gone to 600. As long as you replace on levothyroxine, that is fine. We, similar to TSH receptor antibodies, we don't have any treatments um, to uh, address antibodies. There is some patchy evidence that selenium might make a difference. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it is, it is very strong and good evidence. So I think, again, here, what you need to do is uh, address the thyroid function and look at TSH um, and 3D4 measurements. Great, I think we've covered most of the questions. So I'll hand back to Julia now, but thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you both, both of you for um, brilliant. Oops, hang on, I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much for fantastic presentations. Um, a, a, a fantastically detailed um, consideration of pregnancy and hypo and hyperthyroidism and really between you you've asked so many of the questions answered so many of the questions that we get regularly you've been I'm sure you've been extremely helpful to the audience but you've certainly been very very helpful to us here in the BTF office where we um, field a lot of these questions so regularly I'm particularly interested in all the information about antibodies so um, and what what damage they can do and what we what we can do about them and and uh, we, really exciting to think that in the future there may be a way of actually reducing antibodies which would help so much um and thank you for everybody who asked such interesting questions um and to Catherine and Christine who uh, fielded them so or trotted through all of them really you really had a really thorough um answer for all of them um anybody who joined late uh, or there were bits you'd like to go over please look, watch, look out for the, the recording of the um, webinar on our YouTube video. It will be there in a couple of days, I expect. Um, and we also like to do a transcript of the questions that come in. So again, if you, if you wait a few weeks, there'll be a transcript of the, all the questions and answers that, that were asked in, in the webinar. So you can go through them again and share them with anybody who'd be interested. If your question wasn't uh, answered or you've got anything that you'd like to ask that you, you've not now thought of, send them to um, us at BTF. You can see this, the um, email address on the screen and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Um, there's, if you go to our website, there's, you'll find a lot more information about all aspects of thyroid disease and managing a thyroid disorder on our website. Um, we'd love it if you'd like to join the BTF and support our work that way otherwise to, to become a member or to donate to us in any way. Um, and, and a quick plug as well for the next in our series of, whoops, get to that one. Uh, uh, next in our series of webinars, Meet the Expert webinars, that will be on the 21st of November. Um, and it will be about all aspects of thyroid research, which I'm sure that many of you would be really interested to know about. Um, so thanks, thank you again, once again, to our wonderful speakers. Um, we know we really know how busy you are, and we're extremely grateful that you've found the time at the end of a working day to to spend with us. And a huge thank you to each of you who joined the webinar and asked such thoughtful questions. So please stay in touch with the BTF. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you.